welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. The following interview is designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Your host, Derek Champagne, is the founder and CEO of The Artist Evolution, a full-service agency building successful brands, marketing tools, and campaigns, and also the author of the best-selling book, Don't Buy a Duck. And now, let's begin today's Leadership Series interview. Welcome to the Business Leadership Series, where our goal is to inspire you to become the best leader that you can be. I'm your host, Derek Champagne. I'm excited about our guest today. I've got Michael McGreevy, who is with McGreevy Leadership, and uh, calling us out of Buffalo today. Michael, thanks for being our guest. Derek, it's an honor to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Michael, I'm in a couple of online groups with you, Facebook groups where some are entrepreneurial uh, leadership groups and others are are how to become a better leader, better father, uh, just some accountability kind of groups. I saw a little about your story and I, that's why I reached out to you I, and I wanted to just learn more about you and so you could hear and inspire our listeners today with the, some things that you've been through in your life and then how you've overcome them and how you're helping others. So if you don't mind... Just start with us with your early years and tell me a little bit about uh, some things that formed you at an early age and maybe some struggles that you have. And and we just want to hear your story, what you feel comfortable sharing. Yeah, I would be happy to share my story. Um, You know, as much as I'd like to think that I've always been a strong leader and somebody that's confident and knows what I want in life, that is just not my story at all. And just to give you an idea of kind of what life looked like for me as a young man is I had, I struggled with severe anxiety for almost, geez, almost 15 years. Hmm. And uh, there were times in high school where I would go home having panic attacks and uh, not want to go back to school at all. If I was called on in my class, I would come up with reasons to leave the classroom uh, just so I wouldn't have to answer a, a question in class because I was so f- freaked out and worried that I would have a panic attack and that I would really have a heart attack and die. And so I I struggled with that a whole lot through high school, even into college. And and there were, there were times in college that I would just, I'll get into really bad stuff just to try to avoid the pain of that anxiety. Hmm. Uh, And so consequently, when you have, when you struggle with anxiety like that, it's, it's pretty difficult to have any sort of vision for the future or any, um, realistic dreams or hopes because you're just trying to survive on a daily basis. Right. And, and that's really what my story looked like. And, um, and so after college, I somehow was able to graduate college, but not with a, not really any focus at all. I, I ended up jumping on a construction crew right after college and and we were building houses. And one day on the job, I was working with a friend and we were on the second floor of the house, kind of working near the stairwell. And um, I watched him step backward and fall two stories down into the basement. And uh, when I looked over the edge, he was the last person I saw. I saw him looking at me as he fell and I looked over the edge and he was in a slump on the basement floor. Oh. And in the midst of my anxiety and fear, it was just more than I could even handle at that moment of my life. But really what I thought was the end was actually the beginning of me finding myself. And I'll continue on to the story. So I somehow I'd, I don't know uh, how I had the wherewithal to do this, but I I ran downstairs and tried to save him and tried to give him CPR, but he was he was already gone by the time I got. Uh. And that evening, I had to go to the hospital and explain to his parents what had happened. You know, he was really a bright kid. He had a a big future. He was just kind of helping out for a couple months on the crew before he went after his dream to be a Secret Service agent. And here I am in the hospital explaining to his parents what had happened. And they are just on the on the ground in grief, just losing it, as you can imagine. And for me, here I am filled with anxiety and fear already, 
and then having to deal with the trauma of this event, it was more than I could handle. And so I was on vacation a few months later, just with all kinds of questions rolling in my mind, as you can imagine. Right. And uh, we were on vacation with family friends, and we're out swimming in the ocean, and I love to boogie board, love to ride waves, and I was kind of just clearing my head doing that. I'm in my mid-20s at the time. And uh, I noticed that I was having a really hard time getting back into the shore. The undertow was just pulling me back. The waves were getting bigger and bigger, and I started to get a little bit worried. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to go in. I'm going to call it a day because I could I could get swept out to sea in this right. crazy surf. And so I, uh, I finally made it back into shore, exhausted from fighting the waves. And I look back out, and I see two family friends who were – there were two girls. One was in middle school and one was in early high school, and they were way out in the ocean. And they're waving back to me as if, like, we are – we're not going to make it. We need some help. And so here I'm here I am uh, a young guy that feels like a little boy filled with anxiety and fear. And my first thought is who can I go find to help them? Huh. Just says a little bit about my confidence at that right. point, right? Like it's not me. I'm not the guy that can bring those girls in. Huh. I need to go find somebody that can because I would crumble. And and so I uh, thought about that. There was nobody around on the beach. Uh, their parents and my parents were several miles away at a cabin. And then this picture came into my mind of this kid's mother in the hospital that I had to talk to who had fallen. Huh. And I realized that if I didn't go in there and do something, that I would have to face these girls' parents again. And honestly, Derek, that was probably the worst day of my life Wow! to do that. And so here's my choice. Relive the worst day in my life by having that conversation with another set of parents or drown in the ocean because I had no confidence that I was going to be able to save anyone. And honestly, drowning sounded okay. Huh. And the reason is, is because... First of all, I wouldn't have to deal with anxiety anymore. I wouldn't have to deal with my fear and my insecurity. And second of all, I wouldn't have to have that horrible conversation with their parents. So the decision actually was easy. And I jumped in the water and just started swimming. What happened was I was getting closer and closer to these girls. And before I knew it, I was just a few feet away from them. And then I reached them. And then I looked at them and I said, listen, grab on to me. We are going to make it. Don't stop swimming until we get back. You know, I don't even know what came over me, but I guess it was the just facing death or kind of giving myself over to the possibility that I wouldn't make it gave me this kind of strength in a way. Right. And... We fought through the waves and the undertow, and eventually all three of us collapsed on the sand, and we were alive. And in that moment, for the first time in my life, I believe that I had something to offer. I had some strength in me, some confidence in me, and I knew that somehow I'd have to offer that to somebody else. Hmm. Thanks for sharing that. I know that's, that's a that's a powerful story. That's got to be tough to share. Mm. Is it is it at that time though? That's when you seem like a culmination of the the tragedy that happened on the job site that brought you even lower and gave you less confidence. But also was an important moment that had to happen in order for you to have the power of, of the of actually saving those girls' lives. Yeah, it it seems that way. I would, I would never say that it was necessary for someone to die for me to have a revelation. But I will say that. That was used for good in my life. Wow. Did that moment, that moment on the beach, was, was your life changed? Was it that powerful and that much of an, a bright light moment for you in your life that it all changed from there? 
you know, it it didn't. <laughs> you would think, you know, in the movies it happens. Like, <laughs> right. Right? Like the, the credits roll and the, the right song comes in. And <laughs> right. My life has changed forever. I have a new direction. I got this now. Well, there's a lot of editing in movies that we forget about sometimes. And, and, <laughs> but we live in the valleys and, in, and on the peaks. And, and sometimes those valleys are, are a long time. And so I like to explore those. And then so tell me what, what happened next. What, what was the transformation for you? Yeah, so I think there was there was certainly a turning point there. There was a when I first believed that I had some strength in me or, or I had something to offer to the world, then I began to even step in that direction of thinking differently about life. And that was that was very helpful for mm-hmm. overcoming my anxiety. And um so then I, I got into a mode, but I didn't have the right tools and I didn't have the right people in my life. But I got into a mode of trying things and exploring and putting myself out there. And um, what that actually turned into was kind of a wild goose chase of looking for the right job for me. And, um, and you know, I went from job to job and I never really did find that thing that, that made me tick. I knew I had something deep down in me that I wanted to help other people see the confidence in themselves and help them come alive and become who they were made to be. I always had that desire in me, and um, I didn't know what to do with it. Hmm. And then eventually, so I became a contractor, a residential contractor, and I did that for several years, and it went really well. It was a successful business, but I still had that longing. Um, and that desire to to help other people and to really invest in other people, specifically men. And that's when I first met Dan Miller. Hmm. I, I listened to his podcast, and he, he talked about coaching as a career and how to be creative about how to set up a business around coaching. And a light bulb went off in my head, and I said, I need to spend some time with this guy. Hmm. And so I went with a couple other friends down to one of his conferences, um, Coaching with Excellence, and I immediately signed up for his coaching mastery program and began to go through his training to become a coach. It's an amazing story. You went from being paralyzed with anxiety and fear of, of the public or a spotlight on you to having this I mean, very one-on-one or personal role of, of coaching others and helping them become leaders. I like learning from people that have, have actually been through some things and to have a good barometer of, of different things. So that, that's great that you have that. And that must be of great value to your to those that you coach. Tell me about the kinds of things that you coach for your clients. Yeah, so I specifically work with leaders one-on-one, and and there are a few things that I see. So a lot of the leaders I work with are younger and in their first 10 years of their leadership journey. And um, there's, a, there's a couple themes that I see. And, um, and one of those things is some leaders are playing not to lose versus going for the absolute best. There's there's sort of this environment that many of us are raised in or we experience in our jobs where we're just trying to hold on to what we have and preserve what we have rather than think about, okay, what could be the absolute best here? Hmm. What could we really go for instead of just self-preservation? Right. So that's that's one of the areas that I coach around. Okay. And I'll mention three things here, and we can go into more detail if you'd like to. Sure. But uh, then the next one is that success, success as a leader starts at home. And so a lot of guys run from their home to the, go invest in their work and become ultra successful because they're not sure what to do at home. Hmm. Eventually, if they don't put that investment into their marriage, into their family, into their kids as a first priority, eventually that success will either be sabotaged or they just won't have quality people, the quality relationships to share that success with down the line. So that's one thing we start with, too, is right away, how are things going at home and how can we start investing in that right away? Investing in your marriage, investing in your kids. And, and then the third thing I'll mention, too, is, is young leaders are often under a lot of pressure, especially from, their, from themselves because they're trying to prove themselves. They're staying later. They're going in earlier. They're, they're tr- almost saying, see, I'm the person. I deserve to be here. Right. And um, while they may be more productive, 
it can be really distracting from uh, what their true purpose is and what they really need to be focusing on because it's about them, right? It's about their performance. About It's about how am I doing? I'm doing a great job, right? See, look at me, look at me. Huh. When, when really that is not the reason they're there. They're there to lead others. They're there to inspire others, and, and that can be a distracting thing. So yeah. those are some, uh, some main things that we coach around, but, but there's a lot of direction. Okay, will you talk to me for another minute about I, I saw you had a blog about the three traps for young leaders? The first one is playing not to lose. And so um, often when young leaders get into a new position, they are so self-conscious about what they offer as a leader, and they want everyone who has hired them and is looking at them now to think that they're doing a great job. And so instead of focusing on that purpose and that mission that they have in their actual position, they start to make that their mission Hmm. of, I am going to prove myself And I'm going to earn the fact that I deserve to be here. And while it's kind of subtle and it seems honorable to want to earn the position that you're in, it can distract from what the greater mission is for that position. So that's one thing is instead of playing not to lose, instead of uh, thinking about how can I make sure that I stay here and hang on to this position, we talk about, I talk with leaders about how can you go big on the mission that has been laid out for you. Hmm. It's so much further beyond themselves, beyond their position. It's bigger than that. And when they start to get a hold of that, they can really be inspired. They can really think big and really inspire others too. To, to go after that same mission. And you talked about success starts at home. Are there any, any other advice that you can give on that? Are there a few fundamental steps for, you say a lot of people are avoiding home or not avoiding home, but they maybe find more fulfillment or they're more comfortable in their work environment where they can produce any, any little nuggets that you can share about the home environment? Yeah. So Derek, we, you and I know we could spend several hours on what to do at home. <laughs> it's, it's a complex <laughs> right. Thing and, and being in relationship with another person is very complex and different for everybody. So I don't claim to know um, everybody's situation, but I know if let's just start with uh, just being married. It sounds kind of ridiculous or maybe even simple, but something as simple as having a discussion with your wife and an open ended discussion on what you want in your life. What do you want together? Like, are we heading in the direction that we want to go? And creating time to have that discussion. So as we work harder and harder as leaders in our businesses, we have less and less time, if we're not careful, for our relationships at home. So often what happens is we invest in so much time in in our business, and then we think we're providing for our home, when really sometimes we're pulling away from our home just to provide for our home financially, if that makes sense. So really, the first investment needs to happen at home, making sure you're setting aside that intentional time to have these discussions with your your wife and, and to make sure that she is the most important person and that she feels like she's the most important person. And um, that's that's a challenging thing to open yourself up to as a man, because what if you're not? What if what if you're not making her feel that way? What if she doesn't have what she wants? Like that's a bigger conversation. But as men, we have to be willing to go there. We have to be willing to ask those hard questions and then work together to find out how to make that work. And so making that a priority, I think is is number one. Hmm. Let me share a little insight on that too. Please. Um so if you have kids at home, this is a very practical thing I learned from from Andy Andrews. So one way to make your wife feel like she's the most important person in your life is when you walk in the door and you have kids. Derek, do you have kids? Yes, I do. Five you and do? seven. Five and seven. Okay. So you, you're going to you like this one. <laughs> so when you walk in the door, I'm betting that your five and seven-year-old probably come running on most days yes. and grab onto your leg or jump into your arms. <laughs> And of course, as a man, the first thing we're going to want to do is run to them and tell them, I love you. Like, so good to see you. And eventually, as we set our bags down and get into the door, we say, hey, how's your day to our wives? Right. So Andy Andrews mentions this, and I think it's so good. And I don't always get it right, but when I do, it really does something. So what I'll do when my son comes walking over to the door and wants to hug me, I just say, hold on a minute, buddy. And I walk past him. And I go up to my wife 
and I give her a big hug and a kiss, and I say, how are you? What that does is my little son is looking up at me, skipping over him to go say hello to my wife. It says, she's the most important person in my life. And what that does for my son is it gives him a sense of stability, knowing that we are together. And then I'll go and talk to him after that. So that subtle little difference of when I walk in the door. That subtle difference is great. Thank you for sharing that. My pleasure. Talk to me a little bit more about finding balance. I mean, you talked about making sure that your family comes first, and I understand that, and and how your time is limited. Are any tips for how you actually find a way to have a balance in life between work and being excellent at what you do in your business and your family and your hobbies? I mean, how how do you find that balance? How have you found that balance? (laughs) So, yeah, it it comes with a cost. I'm not going to pretend my business suffers because I've decided that I want my family to be my priority and my marriage to be my priority. And so that's that's a hard thing to I mean, it's an easy thing to say out loud that you make your family your priority. But to actually live it out is a different thing. There's I, I don't know that balance is something that is achievable. Because there's always something kind of competing for something else. So I think step one is just to decide what is most important. And if work isn't as important as my marriage, then guess what has to suffer if those two are butting heads? Hmm. Work. And so I'll be straight up with you, Derek. I've decided that my marriage is going to be the most important thing. And sometimes my work does suffer because of it. Sometimes I don't finish things because I know my wife needs me at home. Right. Or some, sometimes I won't be able to do a certain project because you know my time with my son is valuable. So I, I wouldn't say that balance is achievable, but I will say that um, it's possible to make, it's, it's worth it is what I'll say, hmm. to make those things your priority. That's great. Anything else you want to share? I mean, can you share a little bit more about, told us your early story about having, having the fear that you had any overarching view of, of, for those that are dealing with something similar of how they might overcome that or what kind of hope is out there for them? Well, I I do want to say anyone that is listening that struggles with anxiety, that there is hope to be completely over that. You can you can defeat anxiety completely. And um, ah, gosh, it's just, it's hard. So Imagine the hardest thing, the thing that produces the most anxiety in your life. What I would say is take a step toward that. Hmm. That's not, of course, not easy. It's not some solution that you can feel good about. But I think the thing that I feared most in my anxiety is probably an uncomfortable death. And when I sort of approached that or felt that and realized that it wasn't the worst thing in the world or or that gosh, I have another day that I'm alive. Like, it's not that bad. Death is coming for all of us. So the thing that you're most afraid of or the thing that you that causes the most anxiety, I would say take a step toward it. Really unpack what is what you're afraid of. Write it down, articulate it, have conversations about it. And um, that'll get that'll take the power of that fear away. Wow. I see on your website, you've got a 10 secrets overcoming fear. Is that something that's available? If our listeners want to go there and uh, share their email, you can send that to them. Absolutely. I'd be happy to share that with them. So, Michael, anything else you want to share with us with with you being a coach and and the access that you have and how you give uh, advice to leaders everywhere? Tell me tell me some just some overarching principles that might be of value. Yeah, so um, I think one of the things that I learned is most important is that I can't live on an island. I can't be by myself. As much as leadership kind of has this persona of the lonely, self-inspired person on an island that does everything on their own, it is just a terrible view of what leadership is. I, I know for myself and for other leaders, we all need other people that we can be vulnerable with and that we can open up to and that we can um, do life with and, and be in relationship with. And um, if, if you don't have that, eventually it's it's going to it's going to sink you. So I, I would say without a doubt, make sure you have a few relationships where you can be completely vulnerable and honest and open. That's great. And you you have found that with with your mastermind groups? Yeah, I absolutely have. And uh actually this August, uh we're opening enrollment for another mastermind as well. So if there's any leaders who kind of feel like they're on their own or or need that or are looking for that, um they're they're welcome to apply as well. 
Great. That's exciting. If somebody wants to learn more about you, can they, where can they go to find out more about the services that you have to offer? Yeah, they can go to McGreevyLeadership.com. And that's M-C-G-R-E-E-V-Y. And I will say this too. If you specifically struggle with anxiety or fear and you want to talk to me for a few minutes, I'm happy to give my cell phone. I have a heart for people that are in that space right now. And I'd be happy to just offer some insight personally. So let me just leave my cell phone. Um, It's 716-713-2957. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. Michael, thank you so much for for sharing your heart today and your very personal story. And it's it's definitely impactful. I know that will make a difference in some people's lives that are maybe dealing with that right now. Um, I I appreciate you. And I'm going to put some links up too when when we air this podcast so that people can click through easier to find you as well. So thanks again. And uh, I look forward to following you and seeing the other great things that happen in your life. Hey, Derek, thank you so much for having me. It was was really good to hang out with you today. You too, buddy. Thanks again. I'll talk to you soon. You've been listening to the Business Leadership Series, where we engage with leaders who are making an impact on their worlds and who want to share their knowledge and experience for your personal and professional growth. This interview was designed to inspire you to become the best leader you can be. Take a five-minute complimentary marketing assessment for your business. Whether you're a startup or an established brand looking for more quality customers for your business, this confidential assessment will help you identify the next logical steps for appropriate marketing tools, strategy, and development for making sure your branding and marketing campaign is a success. Visit AssessMyMarketing.com today. That's AssessMyMarketing.com.